everybody. When it comes to generation, there is almost invariably a universal approach to it. And that's pretty much grab yourself a coil and pass some magnets over it. And that will generate a current. But there is an entirely different way of looking at it. And I pointed this out before, it's a Hackaday project created by a group of Canadians who essentially put a variable capacitor onto some thin film and let it flap in the wind. Using a diode rectification circuit, they were able to collect that energy and light up a few LEDs, which doesn't seem great, but the device they used was astonishingly small. Now it's using a property called the electrostatics and electrostatics are the electrical equivalent of a magnet but they have the benefit of not needing a magnet. Now all electrostatic induction machines work the same way because positive and negative will attract and positive and positive and negative and negative will repel. If we pass a charged plate over another plate it will push the same charges away and collect the opposite charges In something like a Wimshurst machine, this will build up and up and up until we get a spark. And that spark, of course, represents energy. The benefit of them is they're ridiculously cheap and easy for anybody to produce who happens to have themselves a bit of tin foil, some scissors, a pocket full of dreams and a handful of hopes. So I've got some sheet acrylic and I'm going to cut a disc out of it using my ridiculously large hole saw. So let's do that. Okay, and there it is. That's going to be the basis of the capacitor. So let's get that cleaned up and put some aluminium on it. So I've cut myself my big disc, but I've also cut these four little discs because if I try and put an axle through there, what it'll do is just wobble. What I need to do is just build out a little bit with a boss. So I'll glue two discs there, two discs the other side. That'll give me a little bit of a boss. When I drill through that with the 8mm, then the thing won't wobble. So let's glue that on. So that's the disc made with its bosses, and now to turn this into a capacitor plate, we need to make that surface conductive. And I've got a bit of aluminium foil here. This is the stuff they use in heating and ventilation applications, and it's just a bit of sticky aluminium foil. Peel it off and stick it to both sides of that disc, smooth it down, and we're going to have ourselves a capacitor plate. So that's the wheel finished. Now I made a couple of uprights out of acrylic and just bunged a couple of ball bearings in them. The only interesting thing to note is right here I've jammed a wire between the holder and the bearing because this sits in there and of course everything's in contact so that actually makes the conductor for that plate there. So these extra bits, they're dead easy. They're just a bit of acrylic with some aluminum foil stuck on them. There's two so here it is all together. That's really simple, like I say. That's the disc that we made. There's the two acrylic plates we made. We put it on this little stand here so that we can get it to spin. On the back, we've used exactly that circuit that we looked at. So there's the diodes there, there, another one there. And the microwave oven diodes. And I've connected them up same way as that circuit. For the capacitor in that circuit, I've used a microwave oven capacitor, and the only thing missing in here actually is the load, but I've connected a meter. The meter is connected across the capacitor, so if we're able to pump some charge and raise the voltage on that capacitor, then we're storing some energy. So let's give that a spin and see how it does. So you can see I've got that up now to uh, 0.3 of a volt actually, just spinning it by hand. So we are successfully charging that capacitor. That's pretty cool. The cap's got a discharge resistor built in it, so it's going to start discharging again. But we easily got that to 0.3 of a volt.
that's actually really quite cool, hey? So this is a um, one microfarad capacitor at 2 kV, and we got it up to half a volt. So not a huge amount of energy stored, but you wouldn't expect it. I mean, we're using aluminium plates from a quite small variable capacitor. I mean, it's probably a couple of picofarads. Uh, well, nanofarads, actually, a nanofarad or two, something like that. But it is definitely working. We're definitely able to generate some energy from using just two aluminium plates. I mean, next to no torque on that. And spinning it so that flag will obviously work as well. And I didn't like the flag particularly just because it was a, an arrangement I felt we couldn't work with. Where we can work with an arrangement like this and start fiddling on with it. Now, I did that because I don't know anything about the Hackaday project. I didn't know if it would work or not. And I thought it was certainly interesting. Interesting, so worth the replication and that's exactly what we did. Having got it to work in that version what I'd like to do is move it towards being printable. So the next step is to try some of our, here it is, marvellous, wonderful, incredible conductive ink and I'm going to paint a disc that's the same size as the aluminium disc with some of our ink. Then I'm going to paint the two aluminium plates that I made, reassemble the machine and we'll test it. So let's get to painting this disc. So, so we're going to make a conductive ink. Now, conductive inks actually are really easy to make. It's a bit like cookery, to be honest. And there are three main components. There's the active material, which in our case is a conductive material. A binder, which is something to glue the whole lot together and glue it on the substrate you want to paint it on, paper or plastic. And then a carrier, something that keeps it liquid and allows you to do all that uh, painting stuff with it. We're going to choose water as the carrier because, of course, it's really safe and it's really easy to get hold of. Uh, you just turn on your tap or you go dip in your well, whatever it is. The binder that we're going to use in this case is gum arabic, because gum arabic is readily available, it's a food substance actually, and it's totally, totally harmless. So we're going to use gum arabic as the binder, and we're going to use water as the carrier. You can use other materials, obviously, there's a whole range of them to investigate. Using gum arabic, which is what's used in watercolours, incidentally, is going to make the thing non-waterproof, so it will wash off. But it makes a very good binder for electronic circuits where you're not expecting it to come in co into contact with water. If you're expecting it to come in contact with water, you're going to have to use a waterproof binder. Um, something like polyurethane, which is essentially varnish. But there's a whole load of things to investigate. We're going to use gum arabic and water. And to that, we're going to add graphite. Now, this is 5 micron graphite. It's a high quality flake. So it's really uh, going to give a good result in terms of conductivity. And as we're making a conductive ink, conductivity is what we want. That's our function. So when you're making ink, you're looking at the function, you're looking at materials that you can put into a binder with a carrier to make an ink out of it. The conductivity of this ink is going to be directly related to the active material. The more conductive your active material, the more conductive your resulting ink is going to be. Now this 5 micron graphite is actually very good quality and it's freely available on eBay. Uh, they use it as a, a lock lube, I think. You spray it as a powder into locks and you can open the lock. So it's really quite easy to get hold of. Now the first thing to do is to measure out your water. And the water we need has got to be hot water because we're going to dissolve the binder in the hot water. And we take one litre of hot water. Now this is obviously just water I boiled in the kettle. And I'm only doing like this so that you can see it. Stick our one litre of hot water in some kind of glass container and add 100 grams of gum arabic. And then just leave that for an hour to disperse. So in one hour, we'll come back to that. OK, so once we've done that, we get this nice amber liquid. This amber liquid, incidentally, is the stuff you would get if you bought the Windsor & Newton gum arabic in the bottle. So it's essentially the same stuff. Now... To that, we need to add a plasticizer, and because it's gum arabic, we need to add a preservative. And the plasticizer is three milliliters of this stuff, glycerin. So you just add three milliliters of glycerin to that. There we go. And our preservative is going to be this stuff, which is oil of cloves. Oil of cloves is wonderful because it's easy to get hold of, and it's a great preservative for this kind of stuff. And to this, you add one milliliter of oil of cloves. And that will stop it rotting in the jar. So just to run through that again, it's 100 millilitres or one uh, litre of hot water, 100 grams of gum arabic, 3 millilitres of glycerin and 1 millilitre of oil of cloves. That is the binder all ready to go. So all we need to do to that really is add the uh, active material. Now in our case we're going to add graphite and we have 300 grams of graphite. This graphite is 5 micron flake graphite. It's a high quality graphite. 
so it's going to give a relatively high quality ink and that's what we want so we add our one litre to a pan because we're going to have to heat this heating it ensures dispersion and helps degas it and that's why we're heating it so just put it onto the heat and get it hot when it's hot obviously it will begin to boil and to that you add your graphite now the graphite won't mix automatically It'll take a little while, but as it heats up, it will begin to mix. And we stir that for three minutes. So after you've stirred it for three minutes while it's been boiling, that's your ink actually done. Now you need to make sure that you stir out the lumps, or you whip out the lumps, or something like that, so it's not lumpy. But you can use it like that, and it's basically done. Now another great preservative actually is this stuff, which is just Listerine. Add about five millilitres of Listerine, and that'll stop your gum arabic going off. Now, if you happen to have one of these things, this is really worth using. This is an Indian wet spice grinder. It's basically two stone roll um, rollers go around a stone base and use it for making curries, that kind of thing. You can buy it on eBay under wet grinder. And what's really important with making these inks and paints is actually the mixing. It's, it's to ensure that everything is mixed properly, and that can be really difficult. Like I say, you can use this just by hand mixing it and using a blender, but, uh, sorry, not a blender, uh, using a whisk. Uh, a blender is a bit too harsh on it, it'll make it froth. But if you've got one of these things, it's well worth using one of these things. And all you do is pour it in there, turn it on, add another 500 millilitres of water, and give it an hour to grind away. <laughs> There we are, after an hour of that, what we end up with is this beautiful, beautiful, smooth uh, graphite-based conductive ink. And we're going to pour that out and give it a go. There you go. What was previously aluminium is now our ink. So I've painted the central disc with our ink and I've painted the two side plates with our ink. And now we're going to put the thing back together, give it a spin up and we'll have a comparison with this and what we did with the aluminium sheets. Okay, so we've got this thing set up in exactly the same way when we had it with the aluminium, but now, of course, we've painted it with our conductive ink. And here is the meter right here. Let's give it a spin and see what we can get. If you saw that half a volt just by spinning it by hand. That's awesome. Let's stick the drill on and see what that does. One point four nine, nearly one and a half volts if we spin it by the drill. So. 
That's quite surprising. We actually got a better result with the ink than we did do with the aluminium, which is very cool. So I'm quite willing to admit I might be getting carried away with this, actually. But I'm going to tell you what I sort of came across while I was working on this machine. And if you fancy giving it a go yourself, you can obviously either verify or refute what I'm saying. Hopefully you'd verify it. Now, I've set up this machine, as I say, it's a Bennett Stubbler, and it's different to the one that was on the flag. On the flag, they've basically got three layers, and those layers waft in the wind, and their theory is that it makes a variable capacitor, and that that capacitor is an electron pump, and it's not an unreasonable theory, apart from one thing. Hidden in the paper, the guys note that if they put uh, insulation tape across the surfaces of their conductive pieces, it stops working. Because that's really interesting because it makes you think, okay, maybe it's just not induction. Because remember, two conducting surfaces that move across each other or one has a small charge will induce an opposite charge in the other metal plate. And that's where a lot of electrostatic machines actually get their um, ability from, from the power of induction and alternatively earthing it and not earthing it. Um, so if it was pure induction, then... Putting some insulation tape over the top wouldn't make a blind bit of difference. But because they put insulation tape across the top and it stopped working, it made me think, well, maybe there's an element of triboelectricity here. Now, triboelectricity is the thing you get when you rub a balloon on your jumper and it'll stick to the wall or pick up papers. You can electrify something just by rubbing it hard enough, and that action of rubbing knocks a few electrons off, and it gains a charge, a static charge, which you can do various things, like make your hair stand on and etc. But it made me think maybe there's an element of triboelectricity in that. Now, when we spun this um, yeah, last night by hand, we actually got quite a reasonable result from it. About, I don't know, was it a volt and a half or something? It was uh, slightly better than the aluminium anyway. But we got a reasonable result from it. Now I just need to put some gloves on. And the gloves are on because, remember, our metal bar there goes all the way through and is attached to one of the wires and is, in fact, a conductor. So I'm insulating myself from the conductor so that I don't affect the experiment because, obviously, I would act as an earth if I touch that metal bar. So if I take my Bennett's machine and I give that a spin, we've got the reading here. It will actually start to uh, go up and it'll go up to a fault or so. I've got a bit of cotton wool here. We've already got it a half a volt just by that. Let me put this on. It's got up to four volts just by gently holding a piece of cotton wool against the surface of that. So there is some element clearly of triboelectricity. And what you can see scattered about here are all the other things that I tried. I've got a bit of wool felt there. I've got some rubber that will be uh, EDPM. I've got some PVC. I've got some HDPE. I've got some man-made fibres that I'm not sure what they are. I've got some cotton. I've got some waxed paper. I tried a candle. So I tried all kinds of things to see what effect different materials rubbing against there would have in their contribution uh, of triboelectricity to the way this whole thing works. But the astounding thing was, here's a bit of carbon felt. Now, it's conductive, and obviously I've got my other hand in a glove as well, so it also is uh, insulated. Now, I don't press this very hard. And we're already up to six volts. I was just resting that against there. So it's just gently rubbing it. There's not a lot of pressure on there. And we can get that up to six volts, no worries at all. See how low it's going down. The other cool thing is if I keep spinning that, then the effect lasts. Now, this construction I've got is on my dirty bench, there's lots of wires, so it's got a fair amount of leakage. 
So the electric static charge I put on that plate will in fact leak away uh, relatively rapidly. We need to improve it against leakage for that to retain. But that slight rubbing that we did with the carbon felt or the cotton wool transfers enough static onto the surface to make this work very much better. Instead of being a volt or so, it's now getting up to 6 and 10 volts and that will actually last. Now, personally, I think that's astounding. Okay, so I've got a little double A 1.5 volt battery there that I've put across this capacitor. It's not actually connected, it's just resting across it. And I've got the other wire to give it a little touch. So if I give that a little touch, then obviously what we've done is dump a little bit of charge onto the capacitor. And now I'm going to spin that up. There you go, we can get that up to about 4 volts. So in order to improve the output of this, to me it's pretty obvious, we need an element of pre-charging, which can be resting something on there to get a bit of triboelectricity going, so like cotton wool or maybe carbon felt or maybe a bit of wool. I mean, for sure, if I could have got my cat here, I'd have put her against it to see how she did. But resting against something to pre-charge it with a bit of triboelectricity, or pre-charge it with something like a double A battery where you just give that little bit of charge just to get it going. And once you get it going, the output shoots right up there. And it's why I think that that flag system is actually working and when they insulate it, it doesn't because there's an element of tribal electricity as well as induction. Now we made this in exactly the same way as we did in video 1340. The only difference being instead of using aluminium, we used our conductive ink and it works, if anything, slightly better. Now you've got to remember this is an electrostatic machine, so even though the voltage is quite high in these terms, it will be a very low ampage. What we need to do is have a look at that. But it looks to me like this idea of printing an electrostatic generator has moved one step closer. We've taken the um, flag circuit, attached it to a standard electrostatic generator, converted that to a printed or painted electrostatic generator. The next step is just to get a bit more involved with that. I'd like to look to see if the flag actually works with, um, the thing, with the painting, I think. And then, of course, we've got to have a look at the fractal capacitors to see if that network actually does it. Because although they say these kind of things, of course, I don't know. I've not tried it. Having tried it, I can say that it does seem to be working. And, of course, that's very exciting. Anyway, that's the next step in the progress to see if the actual ink works so that we could have the potential of printing it. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching. Please like and subscribe.